Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Josh Byerly at NASA's Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. We're going to be talking today about the spacewalk earlier this morning by Chris Cassidy and Luca Parmitano uh, that was ended earlier than planned. The uh, spacewalk was due to last about six and a half hours. To my left is Kenny Todd, the uh, chairman of the mission management team. We're also joined by David Korth, who was the flight director on console today. And we're also joined by Karina Eversley, who is the spacewalk officer that was overseeing today's operations as well. We'll hear from each one of them and then we'll take some questions both here in Houston at other NASA centers and also on the phone lines. We'll get started with Kenny. Uh, thanks, Josh. First of all, um, I want to thank the uh, ops team today. Uh, uh, the, the team uh, had a good plan going in. Uh, sometimes you have to adjust and this is one of those days where early on we had to make adjustments and, and David, Karina and the rest of the ops team did a great job and, uh, and uh, making sure that, that we, we did our number one objective, which is to uh, get the crew back in the airlock, get them in, into the ISS safely, and, and that, uh, that goal was accomplished. So uh, from that standpoint, I think, uh, I think we can all uh, breathe a sigh of relief and, and say that indeed we did have some, some success today. So um, crew's in good shape. Um, and, uh, and so uh, Dave and Karina will talk to you a little bit more about, about the specifics of what happened today. Uh, as far as where we go from here, um, clearly we have a problem at this point that we don't quite understand, and we're going to take uh, the next day or two and, and sort through that, probably do a little bit of troubleshooting on orbit, and the team will, will be working through the fault tree and, and, uh, and trying to determine what kind of things that, uh, that we could do on orbit and, and here on the ground to try, to try to get a better understanding of what's going on. So, so that's, that's kind of what I would term the immediate future. As far as as where we're going to go um, past this, do we need to go do this EVA? Does it need to be done quickly? Uh, that's just the, the type of thing that, that through our normal uh, processes here on the ground, we'll, we'll take the set of requirements that we have remaining and go try to, try to bounce them up against the other things we need to do over the next several weeks and months, and, and we'll find the right time to, to go do this EVA once, uh, once we understand exactly what happened uh, on orbit today and, and how we can ensure that, that it won't happen again. So. Uh, from that standpoint, uh, we have no, uh, no time clock that we're working to, um, and, uh, and certainly when you have an issue like this, you want to make sure that, uh, that you uh, uh, turn over every rock and, and make sure that, that, uh, that we've dealt with the, with the issue in, uh, completely. So uh, with that, that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at from a program standpoint. I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to David, and he can talk to you about the uh, specifics of what happened today. Okay, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll talk a bit at a, a higher level of uh, kind of the timeline, the flow of events today, what we did accomplish, uh, a little bit of what happened and why we came in, and I'll ask Karina to fill in any specific details. Uh, the crew was ready for the EVA today. As uh, Kenny mentioned, we had a good plan going into it, and uh, in fact, they, they started off about 18 minutes ahead of the timeline getting out the door. Uh, we knocked off the first two tasks that were planned for the EVA, and uh, at one point, Chris was about 40 minutes ahead of the timeline. And it was about at that point where uh, Luca noted to us that he, he had a CO2 sensor uh, in his system that, that was bad. He wasn't able to read his CO2 anymore. So we had some discussion on the ground. And uh, we have rules in place for how we handle uh, bad CO2 sensors. And we can monitor the, uh, the CO2 level of the, the crew to keep them safe and just rely on them really to report any uh, symptoms of CO2. And uh, we progressed from there and uh, had the crew uh, at that point, uh, Luca had already finished uh, the first task of the day, which was the uh, uh, grapple fixture on the FGB making the final data connections. We, uh, we routed the cable, you recall, on the last EVA and we just made the final connections uh, to get that in good shape. And he was starting into the uh, MLM Ethernet cable uh, hookup, and then he was going to route it. And it was at that point, as I mentioned, CO2 sensor bad. We talked about it a bit. And then about six, seven minutes later, he started reporting uh, water, a sensation of uh, water in the back of his head, um, specifically kind of a gush or whatever, just kind of a bubble in the back of his head. And uh, we, uh, we talked about it with him, tried to get a sense of uh, did it just appear? Has it been increasing? And, and the sense we got at the time was that, and, and as well from his perspective, that uh, things were okay, stabilized. He just had this water accumulation in the back of his head. And uh, we drew the conclusion that the CO2 sensor bad uh, was probably related to the fact that the water accumulation, we have a history of you know, CO2 sensors getting wet and it kind of makes them go bad. Anyways, we started to talk about next steps 
and uh, Karina suggested that we hold right there and uh, talk through any implications to the suit and whether we are happy with uh, Luca continuing with his tasks. And not long after that, uh, Chris, Chris was finished with his task, which was the uh, Z1Y uh, y cable jumper install uh, part two. We did part one on the last EVA. He uh, finished it. He was coming over to look at Luca and kind of assess the situation. He said, hey, there's a, there's a larger accumulation of water now around Luca. And he started reporting that um, it was coming around his ears and getting on the front of his face. And it was at that point that, uh, you know, per the rules and guidelines we have, we judged that it was in the best interest of the crew and the mission of the, the task that day that we what we call terminate the EVA. Um, we just weren't going to, it wasn't uh, prudent to try to continue tasks with uh, water accumulating around his ears and, and the discomfort that he had at that point. And so we directed Luca to head back to the airlock. Uh, we told Chris in, in the situation we have here to save the, uh, the bags that he had at that point and then uh, follow Luca back to the airlock. Uh, Luca ended up going in the airlock first. Uh, we, we got him in first. Chris uh, brought one bag back in uh, with these large V guides. That was one of the tasks that he was just about to go work on. He had those in the bag. He brought those back inside. And uh, at about uh, 1305, uh, let's see, no, 1326 GMT, we had uh, both crew in the airlock, hatches closed. And uh, we, uh, at that point, started getting reports from, from both Chris and Luca that the amount of water accumulating in, in his helmet was, was increasing. Uh, so we went through a, what we call an expedited suit doffing procedure, which skips some of the, uh, while more methodical steps of, of getting the crew uh, configured for uh, getting out of their suits and doffing their suits. It hits, hits to, cuts to the chase and gets them out of their suits quicker, and especially in this case, getting the helmet off. So we, uh, we took those steps, and uh, about 10, 12 minutes later, we got, uh, Luca had his helmet and glove off, gloves off, and uh, at that point, we, we started to get assessment of how much water we were talking about in there. And the reports we got was anywhere between a liter and 1.5 liters of water had accumulated in the suit itself, not just in the helmet, but all around the suit. So uh, as Kenny mentioned, there's been a lot of discussion with both the crew and uh, all the engineering teams to try to determine what, what exactly is the, uh, the source of the water, um, what happened. The suits are by all means, the rest of the, the suits are in good shape. The crew is in good shape. Um, they're, uh, of course, interested as we are to find out what, what happened and what caused the EVA to uh, terminate a little early. We, we did get a total of an hour and 32 minutes of PET time, so that qualifies to give them their EVA wings, at least on this EVA, but it's their second EVA. Uh, so those are, those are the main parts of the timeline, how things flowed and, and uh, how uh, the events transpired. So uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Karina if you have any other details you want to add. I think uh, you covered the timeline pretty well, David. Um, I just want to reiterate that you know it's a good day today. The crew is inside and safe, and they're in good spirits. We just spoke with them to ask them some more questions about the suit and what they saw, um, and that will be excellent information for our engineering teams on the ground uh, trying to determine what the source was of this water. Um, you know, spacewalks are really a key part of the human spaceflight program and uh, they can do some spectacular things. We've had some fantastic victories with um, nothing less than building the International Space Station, but of course all spaceflight does have risks and uh, so do spacewalks. Um, the team today, I have a fantastic team that was supporting me um, on the ground as well as the fantastic team on orbit and everybody performed very, very well and so we made the decision very quickly to terminate the EVA when we understood the situation with the water in Luca's helmet. Um, and I just want to say we simulate these types of things on the ground, and that's so that we can perform under pressure the kind of way that we did today, and, and I'm very proud of my team for that. Um, there's a couple of numbers I can hand out that I think folks will probably be interested in. Um, sources of water in the suit. Um, of course, one of the first things we often think about is the drink bag. Um, crew is outside for six and a half hours, and so it's very important that they have a drink bag so that they can remain hydrated during uh, what can be some pretty hard work. Um, our drink bag holds 32 ounces, 
and um, obviously another source of moisture in the suit can be the crew sweating when they're working hard, but that's not the type of, it, that obviously is not going to create the kind of um, quantity of water that the crew was reporting. Um, and then in our cooling system, we have about a gallon of water between the liquid cooling and ventilation garment and the water tanks um, that provide water to our sublimator, which helps uh, then keep the crew cool during the EVA. Um, and uh, the liquid cooling and ventilation garment holds about an eighth of that volume. So those were the things that we were thinking about as possible sources during the EVA. Um, from words that the crew uh, reported, we think it's unlikely that it was the drink bag today. Um, and I would say that I don't know yet uh, the exact source of the water today. So that's part of the investigation that's going to be going forward. And that's about all I have. Okay, we're going to start off with questions here in Houston, and we'll go to the phone line. Let's start down here with uh, Gina. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. I've got a couple of questions. Um, was there any danger of him drowning in his helmet? Was that a concern for you at all? Have you ever seen a problem like this before? Uh, I would say no, we have not seen a problem like this before with this type of quantity of water. Um, concerns with water in the suit, especially free water. Um, one of the things that we worry about is the anti-fog on the, the helmet, which has a, a soapy material. Now, often divers, for instance, may put a soapy material inside their um, goggles to keep them from from being fogged up. And uh, right, and so we've seen water, small amounts of water get in that and then get in the crew's eyes, and that can be very painful. So that was obviously one concern that popped up ahead. Um, hearing and communication, and we did see that today, um, that enough water was in Luca's comm cap that it uh, blocked his ability to hear towards the end as he was coming into the airlock. Um, and yes, if there's enough water, and uh, the interesting thing in zero gravity that folks on the ground may not be aware of is you know, the water pools um, in a big glob, and so it doesn't necessarily go down into the suit, and there's not a lot of absorptive material in the helmet. So. He, he uh, certainly had that risk today, and that's why we took it so seriously and, and terminated the EVA as soon as we understood that we were dealing with quantities of water and not just droplets. May I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, how has he recovered? What are the after effects? What have you seen so far that you're allowed to share with us? Yeah, Luke is doing great. He's, he's smiling and happy, and he's um, all the crew is uh, looking at the suits and reporting information, anything that they can to help us um, investigate the source. Yeah, I would, I would say grace under pressure because, uh, you know, as we, we learned, as he progressed back toward the airlock, you know, the amount of water that he was reporting started to increase and increase. And you can imagine, you know, you're, you're in a fishbowl. So go stick your head in the fishbowl and, and try to walk around. And that's not anything that you, you take lightly. And certainly EVA is dangerous already. And he did a great job of just keeping calm and cool and uh, getting his way back to the airlock. <laughs> okay. Uh, Robert Perlman with CollectBase.com. Um, David, you mentioned that there was an expedited suit doffing, but from the point that I guess the first call was that you were uh, ending the EVA to the point that they reached the airlock was about 25 minutes, and then it took another 10 minutes to repress. If Luca had been in a more serious situation with more water flowing in, was that the fastest that you could get his helmet off, or was there something else that you could have done to purge the water from the helmet before repress or before literally taking the helmet off? Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, we actually have uh, uh, emergency repress procedures, and uh, we could even ratchet up if we needed to the uh, expedi ex expeditious um, traverse back to the airlock. We call it an abort EVA scenario, um, where we think at that moment uh, crew's life is, is imminently in danger. Uh, we did not, at the point, sense that that was the case. We took action at the appropriate time so that that was not going to be the case. Um, but we could have uh, expedited getting back to the airlock um, and then once in the airlock do an emergency repress. Uh, Karina may can share more details about what's involved in emergency repress. It cuts a lot more corners and uh, there's a lot more, le less system reconfig involved and you only do that if you feel like a crew member's life is absolutely in danger at the moment. And a follow up. Um, how do you troubleshoot this? Can you, um, do you have to put back this 
tune together and prepare it for another walk and have it run empty? Or how do you figure out where the water's coming from? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. What we've started with today, throughout the day, is uh, detailed discussions with the crew to get their sense of um, where did they see the water, feel the water was coming from, uh, how much water, and uh, detailed inspections. We, the crew was, has been great about uh, video and photography of, of the inside of the suit, all aspects of the suit, uh, to help the engineers kind of determine what could be the problem. Uh, nothing is jumping out right now uh, as to what the source is, as Karina mentioned. You know, we, we originally thought uh, the easy go-for solution is the drink bag, and it, I think we've, we've pretty much ruled that out, not entirely, but that doesn't seem to be the, the immediate source. So uh, that's, that's the approach we take. The engineering teams are meeting right now um, to go through the photos that the crew has taken and the uh, reviewing the uh, discussion we've had with them on space to ground. Okay, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark. Mark Rowe for Aviation Week. Um, what does the current situation say about your ability to respond rather quickly if you had to to some other issue like a thermal control system problem or something uh, with the power source outside the station? Can you, can you still do it while you investigate? Would you hold that up or is that sort of a question that doesn't have an answer yet? I, know, I, I, can, I can try a little bit, then I'll, I'll let Kenny answer. The, uh, there are, you know, if, if and it, a lot of it depends on what we determine while the engineers go through the, the situation tonight, and, uh, what the nature of this problem is. If, is it a pervasive problem that we need to worry about all the EMUs or not? Um, if it really is something very specific to this suit, um, we have procedures for the crew to resize and uh, get in some different uh, upper torsos and things like that so that we could go EVA if we needed to for an emergency. But it really is going to depend on what they learn and if they can uh, pinpoint this as a unique suit issue or not. I think, and, and, and I'm kind of where Dave was, I mean, we have redundancy in, in suits on board. Uh, they may not be the exact size, but we have ways to, to work around that and have worked around it in the past. So uh, we would be in a position to be able to respond from a hardware standpoint and, and being able to go out. I think it becomes, what do we know about this failure? You know, how stable are we with, with whatever's going on outside? Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we'll lose a loop, and that'll take us down to the point where, where we're, you know, single or zero fault tolerant on some systems, and we'd want to get out sooner rather than later. But we would trade that risk against, you know, what we know and don't know about this particular failure. Let's say if it were to happen tonight or tomorrow, uh, we clearly would want to, uh, to balance that risk to the best we can, and that's, uh, and that's what we'd do. Okay, one more down here and then we'll go to the phone lines. Uh, for Mr. Todd, what, what did you learn from this today? Well, um, what I learned from, from the standpoint of, of the ops team was that those guys are ready to go. You know, if you could have heard the back traffic here and as they discussed, you know, what the situation was with the crew, do we, you know, there wasn't any doubt as to, as to, how, to how to get this done and get it done successfully. It was. Uh, Really, uh, all the training clearly was was paid off. And as far as as far as the crew goes, uh, you know, the crew was top notch experts, and and they were really, um, you know, they were they were part of the team, and they were helping to work through this. And and uh, at the end of the day, uh, like I said, we we accomplished objective one, and uh, and I think it it uh, it brought into mind for all of us that's really what this is all about is to uh, is to go do this risky operation the best way we can to ensure that we uh, we protect the main objective and uh, and today uh, you know uh, um, uh, we we have to do EVAs EVAs are part of this business and I think what at least I walked away from this today is saying that indeed that, that when we have that day that we we really wouldn't like to have the team is really ready to respond and so so it was a uh, from that standpoint I don't walk away with my head down I walk away saying sometimes you get judged by how you respond when bad things happen and and today the team did a great job. Okay, let's go to the phone lines. Now I'm going to call on them as we go down the line. Just a reminder, keep your phone on mute until I call on you. Let's start with Charles Atkinson with examiner.com. Good afternoon, Charles Atkinson, examiner.com. Uh, once back inside the station, Luca said that the drinking water tasted really funny and not like any normal drinking water would. Would that point you more towards the uh, water coolant or the suit? And then I have a, a follow-up that has to do with if you have a pinhole leak, 
out of example, how would the leak begin to move up to the suit, to the helmet? Because um, Cassidy had radioed to Houston that his pants, uh, that uh, Lucas' pants were dry. Yeah, let, let me start. And Karina, you can fill in details. Uh, let's see, the first question, the funny taste. Yeah, we, we, got, we heard the same reports. Uh, Luca reported uh, he tried some of the water, thinking initially that it may be the source was from the drink bag, uh, and it tasted funny which also pinpoints a, a couple of things, and Karina brought up, you know, we w also worry about the, uh, the uh, antifog that we put on the, uh, the visors. That has a, it's, it's basically like dish soap kind of stuff. If you've ever gone diving, you can put dish soap on there. And that has a weird, funny taste. Also, as you mentioned, uh, the uh, garment and the cooling system has a different taste, and it has a iodine that runs through it uh, to keep the bacteria from growing in the, in the loop. So there's a number of different sources, and again, we use that information uh, to help us pinpoint where the source of this leak might be. Uh, secondly, you said if it's a pinpoint leak, how would, how would it end up up in the, the head region versus down in the, the gloves, um, if I understood your question correctly, and, and why is that so? Again, things tend in zero G to, to kind of move around and bubble. Uh, that certainly is a piece of information we learned through uh, discussing with Luca about where the water uh, locations were that um, kind of helps us hone in on where potential areas of concern might be with the suit. Uh, so yeah, we're looking at all that, uh, including the fact that, as he mentioned, the, the water started pooling in the back of his head and, and seemed to increase from there. OK. And, uh, in a radio call to Mission Control that uh, his clothes, his thermal garment, was dry except for normal sweat. I can answer that. I, the what that helps us to answer is there's a connector between the suit, the hard upper torso of the suit, and the cooling garment. And it helps us to say that there was not a direct leak at that location, because it's kind of right at your belly button. So that was, that was very helpful information that Luca provided. OK, and lastly, was this the same suit used last week? Yes, it was. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Leo Enright with Irish Television. Thanks very much, Josh. Uh, I just wondered at what stage were the Europeans involved in all this? This was uh, just about the most serious incident I can remember uh, involving a spacewalking astronaut. At one stage, it seemed uh, Luca was functionally blind, deaf, and mute uh, for various reasons because of the water. So at, at what stage were the Europeans consulted in, in these emergencies? At what stage are international partners consulted? What is the status of the international partnership at that particular point? And uh, has he spoken uh, with uh, the European Space Agency since the incident? I can, I can start. You can talk. Yes. <laughs> the, um, let's see, as far as international partnership, you know, of course, Luca being the, the first Italian spacewalker uh, and a proud member of the ESA Corps, uh, the ESA team relies on us here in Houston as the EVA experts and to handle these kind of situations. And that's also part of the, the foundation of how the station program has been set with the partnership that we, uh, we provide the integration and the, the emergency response. Um, their teams are always plugged in, uh, and their control centers are, are part of our entire uh, global team. So they're aware of everything that's happening. And uh, we do keep them apprised as things are going along. And following the EVA, once uh, Luca was safely back inside, and some of the conferences that we've had with the, uh, the EVA team, uh, we have involved the uh, ESA representatives here uh, in the discussion so that they're aware of what we're doing and what things we're considering and any of the concerns that we've come up against. And um, as far as uh, a, a mission, from a mission management team perspective, ESA is a, a member of the mission management team and, and uh, I spoke uh, with uh, our local uh, representative from ESA shortly after uh, the crew uh, got back in. Um, and uh, gave them uh, the most up-to-date information that we, we had on the incident and what our forward steps were. And as David said, as we've worked this afternoon through some of our technical meetings, we've, uh, uh, we've had that, that same level of participation at the technical level uh, with the with, uh, members of the ESA team. So, and they'll continue to be part of that going forward. And, and as well, uh, their, their medical teams will, will continue to do the same role that they have been in terms of, of uh, 
maintaining uh, uh, status on, on Lucas Hill. Uh, and Josh, if I might ask just a follow-up, uh, which is rather more light-hearted, uh, and that is to do with a, a sequence where the astronauts at the early stages of the emergency paused, uh, and they did what I, I imagine they practiced for doing later in the EVA. They started taking personal photographs of Luca, and he started flipping cards on his wrist, which appeared to be perhaps family photographs, uh, and some paintings or, or something of that sort. I wondered if anyone on the panel knew what was going on there. I realize it wasn't part of the, <laughs> to do with this story, but I, I'm curious as to what was going on. I know that is. The, uh, the crew um, gave us a shout out on the ground. They, uh, they have on their cuff checklist some extra pages and, and we did send them up some special uh, pages that they can tape on there with details about um, the procedures that they were doing today, and they added some extra pages of their own accord and um, said thanks to the team on the ground for the EVA. So that was a really nice gesture on their part. All right, thanks, Leo. Uh, let's go to Miriam Kramer with Space.com. Hi, um, thank you for doing this. I actually am curious about um, where this kind of incident uh, might rank uh, with other spacewalk incidents. I mean, it, it, it was the second shortest um, in, in history, but I'm, I'm curious, is, is this considered a particularly dangerous incident? Because I, I remember that same moment where they were taking photos of each other, too, so it seemed as if it was pretty lighthearted uh, through the course of, of, the, um, of the spacewalk. But, but yeah, where does, this, where does this rank among other uh, uh, EVAs that have been cut short? Well, I'll look at Karina. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say today was uh, certainly a very serious issue. We have had EVAs be cut short for other things that um, can ultimately be serious as well, uh, carbon dioxide uh, levels rising being one of them. And we do watch all those things uh, closely on the ground so that we get the crew back inside um, before things get, get too serious. OK. Uh, let's go to Irene Klotz with Reuters. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I have a, I have two questions. The first is um, just before Parmentano reported the uh, the water issue in his helmet, he was wedged. Um, reported that he was wedged between modules, and maybe that sounded a lot worse than it is. Could someone please explain what was going on and if it's possible at all that the suit was damaged at that time? And then the second question is if there were any precautionary medical um, um, protocols or anything that he's been asked to do. Thanks. I can answer the first question. Um, we specifically asked him some questions. He was in a work site that's fairly tight, and there is a heat exchanger mm -hmm. in that area as well. And we were asking him some questions about um, the reach into that area so that we can verify that against our training mock-ups on the ground and make sure we understand what the um, difficulties would be of performing a heat exchanger in uh, change out in that location. So that was that was planned. He was not wedged um, in there by accident. He was giving us information. Yeah, I'll address the second part as far as the. Uh the surgeons. I, what I failed to mention earlier, uh, the gentleman from Ireland asked about the international participation and involvement. Uh, we do have resident here just for this set of EVAs, uh, some of the uh, surgeon team from uh, ESA. And so after the first EVA, and as well as following this, when we arranged for them to talk uh, to Luca to assess his health, and uh, they've, they've not reported any, any ill effects from the, uh, the EVA. Um, so if he ingested any any water that was um, tainted from the liquid cooling garment or the film on the inside the helmet that you had mentioned earlier, there are no health implications for that? Yeah, none that we're aware of. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Irene. Uh, let's go to Elizabeth Barber with Christian Science Monitor. Elizabeth, are you there? All right, let's move along to Carrie Sheridan with AFP. Uh, 
All right, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, if the two water sources are either the water bag or the Garmin cooling system, the Garmin or the tanks, doesn't this mean the Garmin or the tanks are the number one suspect then at this point if it's not the water bag? I would say that the likelihood of the leak coming from the drink bag is um, pretty low at this point given what the crew has uh, told us, but like we always do, I'm sure you've seen these press conferences before when we have different things that don't go as planned on orbit. Um, our whole spacewalk community will be working through a fault tree um, and checking off every possible source that we can think of. So. Okay, I have two more questions, if I might. Go ahead. Um, I'm wondering um, the risks um, of all that water inside his helmet and inside the entire suit, actually. Um, are there systems in there that could have, if wet, could have given him a shock? Uh, and I'm wondering, it might you know choking or drowning even have been a possibility if he'd had no relief? Uh, so the choking or drowning is definitely a possibility. Um, there's very little in the way of electrical systems inside the suit on purpose because it is also a pure oxygen environment. Uh, so the only systems inside the suit that are electrical is the, the COM cap and the biomed sensors, which are pretty low, uh, low voltage type systems. Thank you. And my, and my last question had to do with the, the, uh, the, tens, the tension, the tension um, in, in mission control. Is this what's all happening, especially as the, the problems seem to mount and you could see, you could hear, you could speak. Um, was that scary? Uh, I, I'm just wondering, how would you characterize that? It, it must have been some hairy moments for the flight controllers as well. Yeah, as, uh, as already mentioned, you know, the teams, we train a lot of these things and we go through uh, generic and then uh, task specific simulations and we, uh, we always try to train uh, some level of emergency and uh, you get to where you are in our business, whether you're the EVA officer or anybody else in the control room uh, by uh, having proven that you can go through things and think clearly and kind of divorce yourself from the uh, the actual moment at hand and just work through the way you've been trained, work through your procedures. And, and that's kind of the way the team actually performed today. They did a great job. Everyone responded uh, very promptly, very succinctly. And uh, we worked through uh, understanding where we were. And as soon as we got a good sense that uh, from both Chris and Luca working as a team on board that the, uh, the water was increasing in volume in uh, Luca's helmet, uh, we immediately kicked into the terminate EVA mode, and everyone understood clearly what that meant, and uh, we got him back in the airlock, expedited getting the suit and helmet off, and uh, got him in a, in a safe configuration. And so how, how big of a relief was it when you finally got the helmet off? I mean, was there an audible sigh going through the mission control? Tell me, tell me how that moment was. Yeah, for me, you know, anytime you do anything like EVA or whatever, it's always dangerous. There's always a, a great sigh of relief inwardly when the crew's back safe inside, period. Um, honestly, going through the moment at the time, um, a lot of it was starting to think about why. Why did this happen? What could have gone wrong? And uh, what, do we, what data do we need to gather uh, before the, uh, the moment passes us? too far and we, uh, we uh, lose the sense of, of the detail. So those are the first things that we start thinking about and there's time later on to sigh relief. Thank you. Okay, Marcia Smith with Space Policy Online. Yes, I had a question about how long it took, again, for the uh, crew to get back into the airlock. And you had mentioned that there were even more expedited procedures that you could have used. So would you confirm it was 25 minutes before they got back to the airlock and then 10 minutes before they were out of their suits? If, is that about right? And, and how much more quickly could they have gotten back in if you'd realized how serious it was? Yeah, I don't have my detailed timeline with me, but it was about 20 minutes from the moment we declared, uh, let's terminate the EVA, until Chris was back in the airlock with the hatch closed. Luca was back in the airlock uh, much sooner than that. Um, Again, I, I, I don't have the specifics with me about how, how much quicker the uh, expedited or the emergency uh, repress scenario works out. I don't know if 
you remember that? The, the equalization valve in the hatch can uh, repressurize the airlock very, very quickly. I don't, I don't know, have a number, but um, if we had needed to turn that to the emergency position, and we had actually uh, given Karen on board the heads up and the, and the EBA crew as well to be ready and that they could do that if they needed to, and they just turn it to a new position and it would repressurize the airlock very quickly. And the other thing that we always practice with all of our EVA crews is um, a crew rescue scenario. So if Luca had needed additional help getting back in the airlock, um, the crew would have been perfectly prepared for Chris to come help and uh, get him back in the airlock any quicker. Thank you. And could you also uh, go over again how many functional spacesuits there are, still are on the space station? So I know that we have two because um, we had uh, each of the two crew members can size up to the next size. We That's something that we check before we do EVAs to understand what our backup suit capability is in case, for instance, we had a problem with the suit while we were checking it out before these EVAs. So uh, we do have at least two, and we've got a number of other parts on board, and I haven't counted up how many of those parts could be put together into additional suits. Okay, thank you. All right, Amina Khan with Los Angeles Times. Hi, um, uh, thank you for, for taking my questions. I just have a couple. Um, of the one to 1.5 liters, how much of that was in the helmet and how much was in the suit? You may have touched upon this a little bit already, but where exactly was the water in the, in, in the suit, not the helmet distributed? I would say the majority of the water that they reported was in the helmet. You know, obviously some of it got absorbed in the, the comm cap, the, the Snoopy cap that you see the crew wear. Um, that's, that's really the main place that they reported that water had been absorbed. Um, so I'd say the mo most of it was in the helmet. Okay. And have there been any other incidents of, of damage to, to suits? I mean, what's the normal sort of wear and tear or or sort of accidental malfunctions with, with suits that you see? Uh, we have not seen a situation like this before. Um, you know, we've had a smattering of other things, for instance, um, CO2 sensors, uh, as it's been mentioned before, those are susceptible to water um, in the, the ventilation loop, moisture in the ventilation loop or humidity. Um, we've seen that a few different times. Um, but overall, I, I would have to say that our suits are very robust. They're, uh, they're well designed, and we don't very often have problems with them. Thank you. OK, Bill Harwood with CBS. Hey, thanks, guys. Making sure you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks. Um, you know, I just wanted to parse the answer to a couple of these earlier questions about uh, the situation Luke would have been. I mean, is this a case where you, you ordered an early termination because you wanted to protect against the possibility of him being in real trouble, or was he in real trouble? It, it was clear that he was having trouble, and we were definitely in a situation where um, we weren't expecting to be. You know, we don't expect any water to be in the uh, above and beyond just normal sweating inside the uh, the helmet. And when he started reporting that it was accumulating around his ears, that's the point at which we said, you know, we are not comfortable doing anything else uh, for the rest of the EVA. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want my team to press forward or have Luca press forward trying to do any tasks where we couldn't guarantee that he could hear us clearly or understand what we were telling him. So it was that point that we uh, said, this is a good, good place and a good reason to terminate the EVA. Um, certainly when he got back to the airlock, the water accumulation started to increase and so we knew we had made the right decision. Thanks, and one more quick one along those lines. Um, water in the helmet, um, I'm trying to picture that fishbowl thing you were describing earlier with, without gravity. And it, and it sounds like the real threat would be starting to cough, um, and you'd have a hard time with that, and then that could get to be something worse. Um, is, is that kind of the threat you face if you have too much water in the helmet? I'd say yes, that's, that's a correct assessment of it. Um, and. You know, if it's just a little bit, obviously you cough, you can expel that similar to how you do here on Earth. But like I was describing earlier, in zero gravity, the water tends to want to um, pool in a, just a big glob. Um, and I, there's some interesting videos probably available on YouTube that um, uh, I believe it was uh, Chris Hadfield did. Somebody asked him, can you cry in space? And so he did a little bit of experiment with a water bag, and he basically squirted water in his eye. And you can see it just becomes this big glob of water in his eye and doesn't go anywhere, so. 
Okay. Just one more quick one for me, just to follow up Marcia Smith's question. You had the two suits you used today, and I guess what you're saying, Karina, is you have enough spare parts. You could possibly assemble a third, or do you have two backups? I was confused. We have two full backups thing. that were would have been ready to go today if we had needed them um, during some of the preparation work for these EVAs. So we do have two full backups and then additional parts on top of that. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, let's go to Todd Halverson with Florida today. Uh, thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, great. Um, this was uh, the 171st EVA since the assembly and maintenance of the station began in late 19. 98, and I'm wondering what this incident says about the fact that you guys have been able to uh, pull off this assembly uh, and all of the other work uh, without having a bad day, and I have a follow. Well, I think it just uh, it just more is a testament to the to the uh, the hardware that that gets produced, that gets gets flown to orbit, and the. Uh, and uh, again, along the way, we've had our challenges. As Karina said, you know, we've had some problems with CO2 sensors, but the team understands what to do when we have those problems. They're not, uh, uh, you know, they're not life-threatening uh, when you manage them properly. And so uh, the team has figured out how to manage their way through those. Uh, but the, uh, the robustness of the hardware that, that has, has come out of the EVA project has been, uh, been very good through the years. And, and as you said, we've done a uh, a lot of EVAs, and uh, we've had a uh, you know very good performance in the airlock. And so, uh, again, we'll go figure out what happened in this instance, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll get back up and get ready to go do uh, do the next EVA when when it's required. Uh, thanks. Um, and uh, I also wondered, you know, what you would um, or David would say about the risks that are involved with spacewalking work, just in a general sense. Um, I mean, you guys mentioned that this is part of the business of operating a space station, but I'm not sure the public understands exactly uh, how much risk there is involved here, and I'm wondering if you could characterize it for us. Thanks. Well, let's see if I can sum that up in a couple of seconds. Yeah, I, I can tell you personally, I've gotten a, a, a much greater appreciation of what goes into preparing and conducting an EVA. Um, and I've been in the flight director office for about seven years and getting deep involved in this. There, there are many, many factors and, you know, not to say this lightly, but the, the devil is in the details, absolutely. And, and the folks um, in the EVA project, the, the EVA operations team, uh, spend a lot of time going through the details, um, whether it's procedures, training, the hardware, the maintenance of the hardware. Uh, there are a lot of aspects to this that you have to take into consideration. Uh, you got to consider uh, temperatures outside on the different modules and where the crew's going. You have to consider how they get from point A to point B. Um, you want to make sure they're tethered properly, that all their equipment is tethered properly. Um, Micrometeoroids, you're always worrying about your procedures to deal with, uh, you know, the unexpected and, you know, uh, hit of a micrometeoroid or something that punctures the suit. We worry about gloves. Um, we worry about uh, things floating away and not getting away from us, being able to have leverage at the work site so you can, uh, you can get your task done in a, in a good manner. And everything is optimized for a six and a half hour period of time outside. And uh, you're in a very limited mini spacesuit or mini space station that's going around outside um, that's got limited consumables. So you got to get a lot done in a short period of time and get back in safely. So there's a lot that goes into it. I'm certainly much more appreciative of what's involved. And uh, we, that's why, you know, as Kenny mentioned, we don't take EVAs lightly at all. And uh, everyone that goes out the door, uh, we try to do our best to meet the requirements. But when the crew is back in at the end of the day, that's, that's success. All right, thanks, Todd. Let's go to Alan Boyle, MSNBC. Hi, thank you. Uh, I just had a couple of follow-up questions about the rate of the accumulation of water. Uh, it, that suggests that it was actually a leak in the system rather than just a normal accumulation of water. And how much time do you think you had uh, left just 
judging by the rate of uh, how the, the water was rising, so to speak. Uh, it was definitely a leak in the system. This was, this was not a normal amount of water, um, and I, I really couldn't quantify a certain amount of time left. Uh, but uh, it definitely was accumulating at a pretty fast rate. Uh, what, did it seem fast to you? Uh, were, were you surprised by finding how much more water there was uh, when Luca and, and Chris got, got inside? Um, I don't know that I would say I was surprised. Um, we knew that there was going to be a, a good quantity of water, and to be honest, I hadn't thought about what the number was going to be. Um, so. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Alan. Do we have any follow-ups here back in Houston? All right, that's going to wrap it up for us. We will, of course, keep you updated on the latest during Space Station Live, which airs every day here on NASA television at 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and, of course, on the Space Station uh, webpage on nasa.gov, which is www.nasa.gov station. Thanks so much for joining us. We will see you back here tomorrow morning for Space Station Live.